I'm like concerned because that my stepdaughter might be listening. <laughs> She's got her headphones on. When you're trying to tell them like, hey, supernatural things are not real, like this is not real. But in this case, it is. After I read this one, I suspected what my experience would be going into this one. But now that I've read both of these, I know moving forward exactly what to expect from this author. Um, Oh, hi. Hi. <laughs> oh, now you're nice. The man can see straight into humanity. Oh my god. Wow. Wow. What's up? It's day four of Halloween? No. What's up? It's day four of Winterween. No, nope, it's Summerween. Get it together! You ever set out to do something and you have it on your checklist? and it's got a little box and you just wanna get it checked off and then life happens. And turns out you can't check that box because it's not even the same thing it was when it started, when you set out to accomplish that. Now it's a completely different thing and no matter what you do, you can't check that off. So now we have to change the expectations after the fact. And that's hard to do, my friends, but here we are. This video started out as a summerween video. It's now, hmm, Monday, the 15th of July. So summerween has officially been over for four days and I'm still going, but you know what? I read three books in the last seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 days. I wanna to talk to you about them. It's not the thing that it was supposed to be when it started, but here we are nonetheless. This is the Summerween, not Summerween vlog. The first book I'm starting with is Incidents Around the House by Josh Mallerman. So here we go, y'all. This was released on June 25th, so this just came out. Today is July 5th, if I didn't already say that. Yesterday was the 4th of July. I'm done with work today. It's been, it was a day. It was not, it was a shorter day, which is nice, but it was just like, let me back to my weekend. So here we are. Started reading Incidents Around the House. This is the author of Bird Box. I liked Bird Box. That's another one where I actually watched the film adaptation first and then read the book. This is so different, but also similar to Bird Box in a way, actually. He knows his audience. He knows where your mind's gonna go when he pushes you down a certain path and he uses that against you. It's clever, it's clever. Uh, it's a horror novel about this family. It's being told from the perspective of a young girl, Bella. I love that Josh Mallerman is choosing to do this entire story from the perspective of a child. There's no back and forth, there's no perspective of the parents and then back to the child. This is all from the child's perspective and that's really hard to do. So I have to give him credit for that. Although I'm gonna critique a plot device that he used, understandably, because this is from the perspective of a child. There's a limited ability to get information. So you only have ability to get information from this one source, right? And it's a child. It's like, oh man, how can I explain that this child knows all of these things? And some authors use, these are like genius children or they're servant. In this one, these parents, very often come and sit in their child's room at night while she is sleeping and just talk to her and confess all of their sins seemingly. So she's like taking in all this information. But what he's doing really well with this is allowing us to see the things that she's picking up on that we maybe don't think she is, but then also showing us something where she picks up on something, but she doesn't understand the implications of that. And so then us as the reader, we understand something that she does not. Rippy, it's the next morning. Sorry, my card filled up. So we're gonna continue this conversation. I do wanna talk about the audio narrator. This is narrated by Delaney Nicole Gill, and they made an interesting choice because at least the audio production did because she's got a very, like she sounds like a child. This is the only audiobook that's showing up for this narrator. So I don't know if this is her like debut narration. I don't know. But anyway, yeah, she sounds like a little girl. Let me see if I can play it for you real quick. He doesn't say more. Amanda doesn't either. Come on, Bella. Mommy says. She takes my hand and walks me out of the house and out toward the car. Dado follows. Fucking dicks. Hmm? Mommy says. We're at the car. She unlocks it and we get in. She has a very effective child's voice and uh, I don't know if it's actually her 
doing it with her voice or if they've sped it up a little bit and so made it higher pitched. I can't really tell, to be honest. The fact that this is from a kid's point of view at all just makes it creepy. There's, did I talk about this yet? There's two different kinds of like creepy child trope. There is the kind of creepy child trope where the child themselves is a creep. <laughs> and it's just creepy for that sake for the for its very nature and then there's the kind of creepy child trope like this where it's creepy because you're getting it from a child's perspective because of the things that they don't quite understand and because of those intricacies props on that i really like the audiobook it is creepy so this family's being targeted by this entity that bella is calling other mommy and other mommy comes to her in the night from her closet and she asks her to let her into her heart and she's been coming around since Bella can remember sometimes she looks like a normal mommy or whatever but then sometimes she has like a really hairy back and she's really big like as big as her room like she has to bend over in the room it's the most terrifying when the when she tells the parents and they're because they're kind of gaslighting her at the beginning they're like no it's just you know whatever like you do like this is the thing because I'm like concerned because that my stepdaughter might be listening, but she's got her headphones on. But like when you're trying to tell them like, hey, supernatural things are not real. Like this is not real. But in this case, it is. But of course it's fiction. So let's not confuse that. <laughs> it's still creepy. And it's creepy because of that. When they realize, oh no, this really is something supernatural that's happening, something paranormal that's happening. And they're listening to their daughter's words tell them from a child's voice. It's just, it's real messed up and it's scary. So character wise, we have mom is Ursula, dad is Russ. Dad is like being portrayed as the ultimate good guy dad. Like he explains everything to her. He, they have their own little games, they're best friends. He works from home, so they're together all day. I don't know what mom's job is. All we know is that Bella says that mom said her schedule is all over the place. And we start to get hints that maybe Ursula mom is cheating. Maybe that has something to do with what she tells her kid about her schedule. And again, we have that like perspective of the child thing coming into play. But yeah, so we're not really sure. They, it seems like they really do love each other. Bella is very invested in keeping her parents in love. She likes when they hold hands. They go to the zoo quite often and she notices that when they ask her to walk in front of them, that's when they're fighting. And so she's like, oh, I don't want them to be fighting. And so you have all this like inner monologue from this kid. Really interested of her actual age, because I don't think they mentioned it. Um, then we have Lois Anderson, who is reminding me of this lady from Poltergeist, because she's like the friend, the occultist friend, and she's like telling Russ, like, oh, we meet on Friday nights if you have any questions. <laughs> also, I'm getting some kind of like parenting tips in here. I wonder if, uh, I feel like Josh Mallerman has to be a parent. There are some tips in here that I think I'm gonna use, explaining different emotions and feelings in a way, like the difference between feeling scared or startled or panicked and like how he explained that to her I thought was really well done. Russ also explains to Bella that he equates intelligence with kindness and he thinks that you can tell how intelligent a person is based on how kind they are to other people and I loved that too. I think that was really cool. So yeah where am I at in the book right now? Let's see I haven't picked it up yet this morning. Okay, I'm about 30, 35% into this. Hopefully we'll finish it today, but I do have a lot of editing to do because I still don't have my June wrap up yet. Five hours and 32 minutes left right now, but I have it slower than I usually do. What do I have this on? I have it on 1.2 because I feel like if I got it any faster, the child voice might be like too high and like squeaky. I don't know, maybe I'll try it. Obviously we're gonna read Incidents Around the House. That's the one I'm already reading. And then next I think I'm going to read The Shining by Stephen King because I've never actually read this. And I think it's time. It's got all the vibes and yeah, it's it needs to be read. And I got this awesome old school copy. Oh my god. Wow. Wow. Um, and then lastly, I'm going to be reading my um, Minute Society book club pick for Summerween. I think Ashley is reading this for Summerween as well. M maybe Gabby's reading it for Summerween. I don't know. Um, maybe she's reading it later in the month. We'll see. But I do want to try to get to this one as well. And this is the one I think might take place in the summer because it's giving like horror movie slasher vibes. So we'll see. So yeah, that's my plan. Three books. I hope to get all three of these in in a week.
what's up? It's day four of Halloween. No. What's up? It's day four of winter ween. No, nope, it's summer ween. Get us together! Okay, what's up? It's <laughs> Hi. It's day four of summer ween. I'm at work right now, but I'm on my lunch break, so I'm gonna update y'all. Um, I finished Josh Mallerman's Incidents Around the House, and I've started Stephen King's The Shining, so I need to update you on both of them. First of all, I haven't decided on a rating for the Josh Mallerman one yet, but I loved this. And I'm, I, I don't know if I'm going to give it, I might give it a five star. I might give it a five star. It was really good. It ended exactly how I like books like this to end. I hope that's not spoilery. <laughs> but it was creepy some of the descriptions of this entity are so terrifying and the way it like changes constantly and it can mimic other people's voices like it is creepy and the way this ends it's kind of open-ended i'm not gonna lie it's kind of open-ended but i know like you know what happened but you don't know what happens after that i want to know what happens after that is there going to be a sequel i don't know i really liked the writing the audiobook narrator did a fantastic job. She's awesome. I think this is at least a four star, if not a five star. I'm going to have to like let it sink in for a little bit, but it's got a 4.07 on Goodreads right now out of like 2000, which isn't a whole lot, but this book just came out and I think that's a pretty good start. I think other people are liking it too. And let's talk about The Shining a little bit because I am only 10% into The Shining and none of this so far has been covered in the movie. I feel like I'm in that season of a reader's life where I am... I like I need to have read these classics and so I a lot of these stories that I've already seen film adaptations for and never read the book I'm trying to catch up on so The Shining is one of them that I absolutely have to read because I know Stephen King does not like the movie adaptation the film adaptation so I want to know what the difference is and the more I'm listening to this I did get this one on audible as well because I couldn't find the audiobook anywhere else already 10% into this I'm getting so much more background information that I had no idea about and I know that The Shining number two is Dr. Sleep and Danny has something to do with that but I'm starting already to get hints about that in the first 10% of The Shining. The movie is less magical and then the book is already kind of feeling magical. I mean, you still have Tony in the movie, I guess, but I don't know. I'll have more opinions once I get deeper into this for sure. I did forget about Stephen King's writing style, which I'm not a huge... Okay, I wouldn't say I'm not a huge fan of his writing style, but I'm not a huge fan of his tone, his writing tone. It, feels kind of like old school, feels old fashioned to me, which it probably is. I mean, this book was written a long time ago. Also, I just learned that Wendy's has the kind of machines that you can add cherry and other flavors to, so you can actually get diet cherry Coke, which they don't actually, they don't make in cans or bottles anymore. Or they make cherry Coke zero, but not cherry diet Coke, not anywhere that I can find it anyway. You can get it at Wendy's. Anyway, Stephen King's writing style can sometimes feel a little bit drab for me and I'm definitely feeling that in this as well but I'm not it's nothing that I I'm surprised by but I did forget like I haven't read a Stephen King in a, in a minute so I'm like oh, okay I'm getting back into a Stephen King that's right one thing that I am surprised by um as far as the character development goes is that obviously we're getting so much more information about these characters we have Jack and Wendy and they are the couple that are going to live in and take care of this hotel in Colorado, I think in Colorado. Jack is a writer. He was an English teacher, but there was an incident at school or maybe not at school or at least with one of the kids in school. Oh, there's Naomi. <laughs> and um, so there's an incident with one of the kids at school and he ended up getting fired or he resigned. They asked for his resignation. Stephen King is making Jack out to be more redeemable, at least in the first 10% of this, which makes sense to me because obviously we need to like get an idea of like who this person is before he go, before it goes south. I know it's going south. I know that's happening. And so, yeah, I am a little bit surprised by some of his redeeming qualities and how he acts towards Danny normally when he's not drunk. And we are seeing that he's got this drinking problem and that he has a specific friend Al who he worked with at the school when he was an English teacher and Al was an alcoholic as well so they tried to quit together he seems like he's kind of like his support um but I don't remember Al from the, the film at all I don't think that character is in the film and probably he's not a huge part of it he's just calling him to say goodbye and we're getting background information and then Danny has his friend Tony who like shows up sometimes and shows him things and he 
has these like premonitions of things that come true. And this is where I'm talking about with like the magical stuff, the fantasy type element that I feel like is being leaned into a little bit more in the book than it did in the movie for sure. Uh, I'm excited for Danny's character. His character is actually reminding me of Bella from Incidents Around the House because of the way he's talking. It's in third person and we're getting the perspective of all three of them, of mom, dad, and kid. And so far they've not moved into this hotel. This is all before pre-hotel. Danny, it's just like his childlike voice is coming through, you know? That's what it, it reminds me of Bella because he's got this, like he hears the word divorce and he's like, I don't know what it means, but I know it's a bad word. I know we don't want that to happen. And then I guess Danny could look into Jack's head, like he did it accidentally or like was trying to figure out how he was feeling and he pulled out a word out of Jack's head and it was suicide. That's scary. That's scary for a kid. And he doesn't know what it is, but he's like, I don't know. I don't want to know what it is. It's probably even worse than divorce. I don't want to know. This story, like the way it's being set up, a lot of props, I, I am enjoying it. And then Wendy also like threatened to leave Jack several times and this last time she was like okay she didn't say it but she was like I need to have a serious talk with you about you know what's gonna be best for me and Danny and maybe for you as well and he's like don't say it now give me one week one week and she said okay and he quit drinking cold turkey in that one week and then just like as far as I know they never brought it up again so he knows what that is he's got stuff going on mentally he feels like he messed up his chances in life because of his behaviors and that it's just kind of pigeonholed him and so this opportunity to take care of this hotel over the winter is perfect for him because obviously he got fired from his job he needs the money they're really broke and then it gives them the opportunity to have somewhere to live and all of their needs get met while also staying away from alcohol because he is trying to stay sober that is the goal and he's also writing a, a play. There was mention of the fact that Wendy actually wrote a novel in the past too, but it never got published. And how he was like secretly excited that she didn't get published because he wanted that for himself. So I feel like the way Stephen King does his characters, it's just like, it's really good because you're getting these great moments of him with Danny and then you're getting these like nasty moments. And in reality, that's who people are. You can't put people in a box and say like, oh, he did this, so he's a bad person or he did that, so he's a good person. I think Stephen King is like using this to show us that like we are all multidimensional, we are multi-layered and we can do things that are very good or do things that are very bad, but also that's just a small grain of sand in what inevitably makes us who we are. I think I'm gonna like this more than the movie. I'm excited to see how it's different from the movie too. So anyway, I'll catch up with y'all later. I have good news and bad news. The good news is that I finished The Shining and I want to talk to you about it. The bad news is Summerween is over. It's now Saturday. <laughs> I thought about just like scrapping it, but then I'm like, you know what? No, we shall carry on. This is not the first time that life has gotten in the way of our readathon, and we're going to continue. We're going to continue with this vlog. So I'm going to talk to you about The Shining, but change of plans. Since I didn't get to horror movie, and this is my book club pick, I think maybe I'm going to either not vlog this or do a separate vlog just of this that maybe will come out after the live show. So we'll see about that. But instead, I got a hold in from my library for One of Us Knows by Alyssa Cole, and it has a pretty low rating on Goodreads right now. It's got like a 3.17, I think, last I checked. Um, but this is one that I'm interested in, um, and it's surrounding this woman with dissociative identity disorder. So this is what's formerly known as multiple personality disorder. And I love that we know this going in because we basically have multiple POVs in this book, but it's all from within one person. It's very interesting so far. First, let's finish talking about The Shining. I don't know, I can't remember what I updated you with last time or where I was at. Generally, I'm feeling very good about reading books for which I've already seen the film adaptation lately. It's better. It's better than the movie. And I'm really happy that I finished this and I read this because not only that, but oh my gosh, y'all, I've been also kind of watching the movie back and forth as I was reading it. Because I didn't want to get ahead of myself in the book. And technically, I didn't finish the movie, but I finished it before. On July 11th, a little after midnight. So it was, oh my gosh. I was watching The Shining 
Wednesday night. And my stepdaughter came in and Shelly Duvall was on the screen next to Jack Nicholson. It was like in the car on the way up to the Overlook Hotel. She goes, why is she a teenager? Why is she with that old guy? And so I started looking up like how old they were. And at the time of filming, I think Shelly Duvall was 31 and Jack Nicholson was 43. So it was like a 12 year difference, not crazy. Like we've seen much, much more vast differences in many, many films. And that night, Shelly Duvall passed away. How weird is that? I just looked it up, it said complications with diabetes. That was her cause of death, but um, man, rest in peace, Shelley Duvall. I feel like we had a weird connection there at the very end, like, and I just happened to be reading The Shining, watching The Shining, and I don't know, just one of those weird moments, you know? She was a very unique and beautiful soul. So, rest in peace, Shelley Duvall. Let's talk about the book. Stephen King does not like the film adaptation of this, and so I looked up why. Stephen King's number one complaint is that he didn't think Jack Torrance had any kind of character arc in the film, and I agree 100%, 100% agree. He did not have a character arc in the film. There was a couple things that the film did better than the book, like with the iconic scenes. Even though Stephen King is overly descriptive at times, I didn't feel the terror in that moment. Part of that could be that I already knew what was gonna happen. I was thinking about what if someone was reading this and didn't know the red rum thing, if that reveal got to them as they were reading it, with the way that it builds up in the book, that would have been such a great experience. So I definitely missed out on things like that, but I also feel like, like there's something about Stephen King's writing that just feels like you're hanging out with Gramps and he's telling you a story and the story's great and he's an awesome storyteller, but also he's really tired and he's had a long day and maybe he's gonna start to doze off a little bit, but maybe not. He gets a little unfocused and then he comes back and you're like, okay, Gramps. <laughs> like, like, I just kind of feel like, no offense, well, I guess that kind of is offensive to Stephen King. I don't really mean it to be, but it's a tone thing. It's a tone thing that's like, maybe it's a generational thing that is missing there between him and I. That could be it. But nonetheless, like the character arc for Jack Torrance in the book is everything. Like that was what disturbed me the most about this book. It made me feel disturbed in the same way that I felt when I was reading Misery. And it was, I think, because of that dichotomy of Jack in his character arc and his personalities and what how much of it is him and how much of it is the overlook. He does seem like a really caring, loving father at the beginning of this. And they feel like a real family that has problems, obviously a lot like some big problems because he has anger issues. And, but we go into that, we go into the anger issues and where it comes from and how it's followed him throughout his life. And as the story goes on, we learn about these things that he did in the past where he's like, I fucked it up. And this is his last chance. It really ups the stakes for this family because this is his last chance. He, I just figured he was a scumbag when I watched the Jack Nicholson adaptation because I, I'm sorry, but Jack Nicholson can only play a scumbag. Like he's just slimy looking, you know, and it's bias. <laughs> it's biased because Jack Torrance is not. Like there's a difference between when somebody says, I'm a writer, like I could say I'm a writer and I don't actually write. I, I aspire to be a writer and I could sit down and start writing something, call myself a writer, I guess. You know, there's a difference between that and somebody who studied literature, who went to school, got a degree, went through academia, all of that, then became a teacher, was having things published throughout. Like, and it seems like he had his life on this trajectory where he could have made a really big impact and done something meaningful. And because of his temper, because of his demons, he fucked it up for himself. And then they show, like, talk about his family and his parents and how he inherited this, this trauma as well. So there's just so much depth and so much, so much nuance to these characters. And that's what Stephen King does well. That's why Stephen King is Stephen King. Because the, <laughs> what we love about him, we hate about him. Like he goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on. But it's never just to go on. It's purposeful. And if you have the patience for it, you end up having these characters that are so fleshed out. You can't have one without the other. And that quality that makes it so disturbing is born from that, from the complexity of the character and the contradictions 
of that character within me as as I go along reading the story, as I'm getting into it. Give him grace and then I take it back and then I give him grace and then I take it back and then I say, well, it's not him, it's not his fault. All of it, it's so very human. And I love that his, even though this is a ghost story, it doesn't feel like a ghost story. It feels more fantasy almost. There was so much more in the book about the shine and about Danny. When I think about it, they put little tidbits of that in the movie, but it's just so much more effective in the book. And my favorite character in the story is now Dick Holleran. Holleran? Dick Haller? Dick Halloran. That's how you say it. And I really am excited to read Dr. Sleep now too. I don't know how you can read The Shining and not want to read Dr. Sleep after that. I love how the book ended. So different from the movie as far as that goes. Um, and way more hopeful, I guess. What else to say? I thought I thought it was great. Is it a five star though? I don't know. I don't know. I don't think it's a five star, but I think this is at least a four star. Gotta respect Stephen King. I mean, the man can see straight into humanity. Anyway, let's talk about One of Us Knows by Alyssa Cole. So Alyssa Cole, I think she used to write romance and maybe she still does. I don't know. But then she came out with When No One Is Watching, which is a thriller. This one is said to be Rear Window meets Get Out. I think I gave it four stars. It was really over the top, but I loved the social commentary in here. It was about this black neighborhood in Brooklyn or around where uh, they're about somewhere in New York, I think, that was being gentrified, but the residents just continued to go missing. And we're following a, a woman who is living in this neighborhood, seeing all of her neighbors that have been there for years and years. This is like a historic neighborhood um, are just disappearing. And so yeah, over the top ending, but fun. And I love the social commentary. So I'm interested to see where she's gonna go with this one. Like I said, this is following a character with dissociative identity disorder or DID for short. This is one of my favorite things to explore in psychology in general. It's what got me interested in psychology to begin with. You may have heard me mention this book before. Uh, my is called First Person Plural, My Life as a Multiple by Cameron West, Dr. Cameron West. I don't know if he's still alive or not, to be honest, because this was written in like the 90s, I think. He had DID and then went back to school to try to understand what was going on with him, got his PhD to learn more about it. This is his real life story. This is nonfiction, but love that book. And then also, oh man, that's another one I really want to mention, but I can't spoil that one for anyone, I guess. So we won't. Okay, so our main character in the story, her name's Kenitria Nash, and she goes by Ken. She's got several different altars inside of her, I think seven or eight maybe. They refer to each other as headmates instead of like roommates, they're headmates. Everyone in their system is different age, different even race sometimes. They may have different physical attributes. As far as I know, this is all, this all can be true in real life too. Social identity disorder though, it's, it's very much like one of those things that like some people in the field believe it's a real thing and then some people still think it's pseudoscience. So it's very controversial. I tend to believe like that this is a real thing. Especially after reading Dr. Cameron West's book, I believe it. I could be wrong, but I believe it. Anyway, I got this one from Libby and I am 18% in. So this is how far in I am, just not, not very far at all. But in the, in the program, in the prologue, we see that they keep a group think collaborative journal. And this is for all of the people in the system to keep up with what's going on. And it's a list of all of the alters that are currently active and inactive. We have Della, who is, her role is the manager and caretaker. She is 65 years old. Her pronouns are she, her, she is active. Solomon is about 30 years old. His role is system assistant to manager. Pronouns are he, him. I love that we have pronouns for all of them as well. Empress, her role is teenager. She's 16 years old. She's an active member. Mesmer, self caretaker, emotions. 20 years old, she, her, active. Kiki is four years old and Kiki opens us up. We, she's the first point of view we get, which is pretty interesting. 
Um, and then Ken, Kenitria, she's 37. It says, roll host persecutor. And then that's scratched out and it says TBD, inactive. So when we come to in the beginning, Ken is coming to the front and she's been in the back inactive for six years. So she doesn't know that Trump was the president. She doesn't know about the pandemic. She doesn't know about any of this stuff. And she wakes up like sitting in the water on the side of a river, not knowing where she is. And she's trying to figure out what's going on. Turns out she has been evicted from her apartment and she is on her way to start a new job on an island and she's going to be the caretaker for this estate. Here's the weird thing that I'm gonna tell you because I don't think it's a spoiler because I'm only 20% in. She explains how she has a space in her head and how all of her altars have their own space within her head. So she's explaining like how the system works within Ken. Actually, we hear this from Kiki, from the four-year-old, and she says, well, I don't live in a house, I live in a castle. So there, it's a very specific castle that is inside of her head and where all of these people live in their own separate rooms. When Ken pulls up to this place on this island where she's supposed to be the caretaker of, she realizes it's exactly like the one in her mind. Like it's a duplicate of the one in her mind. She also has no memories of her childhood. Her parents had to give her up from when she was like two to five years old to the foster system and she has no memories. And when they got her back, she was changed. And so obviously something very traumatic happened to her then. DID, from my understanding, um, happens when something happens to a person that they cannot um, make sense of or put it together. And so they, your mind is so smart, it compartmentalizes it for you and separates it off. It's protecting itself from that knowledge um, and giving it to, to a different part that maybe can handle it. This is not scientific. This is just like my impressions. Something real messed up had to have happened to Ken when she was from two to five there, when she went to foster care. Um, for all of this to go down, in my opinion. The guy that's driving this boat freight ferry thing to get her there is like, do you even know what you're getting into? There are so many like old wives tales about this island and I grew up here and I know more about it than these people that hired you and do you even know who hired you? So there's a lot going on here that we don't yet know about. But he says that there's this like legend that like when sailors used to come to this island for refuge or something like that, what was it? It, it was like people have to survive the first night in order to prove themselves or something like that. And so that's the part of the stipulation of her being the caretaker for this is that she has to survive the first night and they make it seem like it's just like a tradition and ha ha ha. But my impression is that something's gonna be messed up that's happening. Oh yeah, and the, the guy also told her there are rumors that there are goblins on this island. Like, I don't know where this is gonna go, obviously, but our main character Ken is already having a hard time just like figuring out life in general and now she has no choice because she has no place to live. So she needs this. She has to survive. Stakes are high. I'm liking it so far. I don't know about the low rating on Goodreads so far. My suspicion is that this is gets really wild and over the top and that's why this has a low rating. But I don't know. We'll see. So yeah, tonight I am going out with my bestie and we are going to a record shop and some of my old band friends that I used to sing with are gonna be playing there. So I'll try to get some video of that for y'all. Should be a good time. And otherwise I'm just gonna be reading this book and hanging out. It's Saturday, thank God. Oh. Oh, 
What's up, friends? It's Monday. I finished One of Us Knows, so I want to catch you up on that and kind of go over uh, my general thoughts about these three books, maybe some connections between the three of them that I found along the way. And I'm gonna have to figure out my final ratings because I still am not sure. Oh my gosh. So we need to do some <sighs> deep digging, digging deep. All right, so let's talk about One of Us Knows by Alyssa Cole. Just finished this one as expected. This one went so over the top. It, it's so similar to this one, but not. Obviously, like, the, the plots and characters, totally different, but the nature of it, the way that the experience, uh, the pacing, it's it's very similar. It's, it's pretty fast-paced, just over the top. It's so out there. This reminded me of a couple of other books that I can't mention because I feel like it would be spoilery. This twist, let's just say this twist has been done before. Um, the DID obviously is not the twist, but there is a lot going on with the, the dissociative identity disorder that I think is interesting and that is creative. She went really creative with this, which I think was smart on her end. First of all, it's fiction. You, you can do that with fiction. You, you have free reign. But it wasn't a sensitive subject because we're talking about mental health or mental illness here. But instead of staying within the confines that make up dissociative identity disorder, she played with it. There's a particular concept that maybe is real. I don't know. I haven't heard of this before, but I'm not going to tell you because I, I, I might be spoilery. It's like a subgenre of DID that was just like wild. Blew my mind when she went there. I was like, what is even happening right now? But the way the mental health was handled, I thought was fine. There are a lot of holes in there. Obviously, there are a lot of things that we didn't get to learn as the reader, like specifics about her childhood and what actually happened in that time that she had gone to foster care. We got the results of that. Like we know, we know what happened because of that time, but we don't know the details of that time. The world building is just different than anything I've seen because not only are we building this outer world, but we're building this inner world. And when we get farther into the story, we find that that our characters have more control over the inner world than they originally thought they did. So it like it expands, it almost feels sci-fi. There's like so it's like the concept of this. This is definitely a high concept thriller. The way this ended, I don't know. It, it might have been a little too much for me. It might have gone a, a hair too far for me. It was like it's hard to it's hard to believe that this is set in our world because there's just there are a lot of things that you have to suspend your disbelief about. I don't know. It was a good jaunt. It was fun. I'm probably going to end up at like a 3.5 with this one. Maybe three stars. I don't know. We'll see how it sinks in. 3 to 3.5 anyway. After I read this one, I suspected what my experience would be going into this one. But now that I've read both of these, I know moving forward exactly what to expect from this author. Um, I have a pretty good idea. And I think what she does, she does really well. She's such a creative author. She tied in a lot of like seemingly random themes 
themes in here, like the whole tower and princess thing. Um, there was like an underlying fairy tale kind of vibe to it or tone to it. Even within this like inner world and the relationships between the altars, she did a really good job making them each feel different. I will say though, the audio narrator, I wish there was one, one specific altar who is male, Solomon. And that voice, I wish she had like done a little bit differently. I can't do it, but I know there's a way like the audio narrators, it's not like making your voice deeper. It's like changing the timbre of your voice that makes it feel like it's a different character. And for that one specifically, it felt like it blended in with Ken's character. I would have liked that to be a little bit more distinct. There's also queer rep in here. There's non-binary rep in here. There are some little like love triangles or like love subplots kind of, but it doesn't really weigh very heavily on the story. It's just kind of there for fun, I think. And one of them I'm like, I don't even really understand how this works, but you know, okay, whatever. That's what I'm talking about. The, the creativity is coming in here. I didn't like the ending though. I did not like the ending. You know what? I'm going to give it a three star. I'm going to say it's a three star. For this vlog, I ended up reading three books. I read Incidents Around the House by Josh Mallerman. I read The Shining by Stephen King. And then I read One of Us Knows by Alyssa Cole. Interestingly, as I was reading them, they all had the point of view of a child, which was a thread that just carried through this entire re reading vlog. We started out with Incidents Around the House. We had little Bella. In The Shining, we have Danny. And then in One of Us Knows, we have Kiki, who is the youngest of the alters within Ken. So that was interesting. They all fall under thriller horror. I mean, that's kind of a given. Also, in a way, all three of these are kind of like hauntings, sort of. All of them play, you know, maybe paranormal, maybe not. But in the first one, it's almost like a possession type story or it's trying to be a possession. It's definitely a haunting story. And the second one, The Shining, I guess that's a haunting story too, though also kind of like a possession story. And then in One of Us Knows, not necessarily possession, but we do have this unique perspective of somebody with a bunch of other personalities within their own mind. So that does kind of tie together in that way, I guess. I would say out of all of these, this is the one I would probably recommend the most. So maybe this one has to be the highest. Incidents Around the House definitely feels like a four star. So maybe this one's 4.5? I think that sounds fair. But that would mean that I rated this one higher than Misery. Is that true? Do I feel that way? No, I still love Misery. So maybe this one's four star as well. I think I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna go, go with four star for The Shining, four star for Incidents Around the House, and three star for One of Us Knows. That feels right for me at this moment. I thought about just not finishing this one, but then I thought, you know what? Better to give you a piece of something or something that maybe is different than it originally started as than nothing at all. So this is where we ended up I'm really happy about The Shining, honestly. Really, really happy about that, even though Stephen King's an old man. Sorry. Again, I've been so mean to Stephen, Stephen King. We have a complicated relationship, but I respect you. Hardcore. I think that's gonna be it, y'all. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. I appreciate you so much. Don't forget, we are reading horror movie for the Midnight Society book club. I'm probably gonna start this one next, TBH, so I can get it read a little bit early and have time to let it sink in before we talk about it. The live show for this is on August 2nd at, I believe, 7 p.m. Central Time. So that'll be here on my channel. Come join us if you want to discuss that. I hope I love that one as much as I think I'm going to. Maybe for the first time I'll give Paul Tremblay a five star. I think all of his books have been four stars for me. So I don't know, this could be the tiebreaker. You, it, the stakes are high. We'll see what happens. I'm really looking forward to that live show with Gabby and Ashley. Come hang out with us. Also, Gabby, thank you as always for putting together summer ween, winter ween, all the weans. Happy weans to everybody. That's it for today. Don't forget, life is short. So read Riley. Cheers and goodbye.